A lot of people think in this day and age that unless you preach out of the New Testament, it, it doesn't have any authority. But I want to tell you that God's Word has authority from Genesis all the way to the maps. All the way through the Bible, it has authority. And I think we need to preach uh, from, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. The, the whole counsel of God's Word is, is what needs to be preached. And, and I'll tell you another thing. If you... When you read your Bibles, you should be able to see Jesus in every page of the Bible because this whole Bible is about Jesus. That's what it's about. When Jesus was in his earthly ministry, he said, you studied the scriptures talking to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, all they had was the Old Testament. The, a lot of times it was just the first five books of the Old Testament. And he said, you've studied the scriptures, and when you study them, they're all about me. So even Jesus himself said that the Old Testament is all about him. And uh, so this morning, as we read Genesis uh, chapter 37, I'm, I, I would like to, to just show you some things and, and maybe uh, allow you to read Genesis chapter 37 in a new light. Because in Genesis 37, it's talking about Joseph and what I want you to understand is how Joseph's life parallels the life of Jesus. And, and uh, Joseph was a, a type uh, for Jesus. He was a foreshadowing of Jesus. And, and I can explain it to you kind of like this. Back when I was a teenager, I used to go to Piedmont Mall in Danville. And then there was Belts and J.C. Penney's and a couple other stores. And you, back then, you'd go in there and get the samples of cologne and perfume. So I'd make my rounds and I'd go make one lap and get some in my pockets and make another lap and get some time I left in my pockets and sticking out with all that cologne and I'd put like two or three different kinds on. I probably smelled like you no know, telling what. But I loved it because see, that little sample of cologne was giving you a taste of what was in the big bottle. You know, it was just a sample. It was a it was a, a foreshadowing of what the true bottle of cologne held. Or maybe you go to the movie theater and you see the coming attractions and it'll show you a little snippet of the movie that is to come later. And, and you can tell what the movie's about, but you don't really know what the real movie is until you see it. And so that's kind of the way Joseph is. That's kind of the way the Bible uses some characters as a, a foreshadowing of what's to come. And it's so amazing. These Old Testament authors really didn't have a full sense of what they were communicating. And Joseph had no idea. He was a foreshadowing of Jesus. It, Joseph was like a little sample of what Jesus was going to be. Uh, you know, what Joseph did partially, Jesus would come and fulfill totally. And so it, you should be able to read your Bible and find Jesus on every single page. And so that's what I want us to do this morning. And we're, we're just going to uh, start with one verse. Verse 3 sums up uh, the whole chapter and, and to some degree the whole story of Joseph. So if you have your Bible, it's Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. It says, Now Israel, who is it's another name for uh, Jacob, Joseph's father, says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord, we come to you this morning, and we come expecting you to speak to us this morning, Lord. We come expecting a blessing uh, from the hearing of your word, that your, your word is the only literature that we can read that promises us a blessing to those who read it, and not only those who read it, but those who hear it, Lord. So we come in full expectation of a, a blessing, of you to change our lives, of you to speak, Lord. And I pray that when you speak, it'll be through me, Lord. Let me be your mouthpiece. I'm totally surrendered to you, and I pray that the words that come out of my mouth will be controlled by you, Lord. I pray also that you would send your Holy Ghost into this place and just anoint each and every person to overflow, Lord. Anoint them. Uh, Lord, and in doing so, soften their hearts and open their eyes and their ears so that all three may be open and receptive to your message, Father. Now, you move in this place today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Joseph. 
Joseph is a, is a type for Jesus. He's a, a foreshadowing of Jesus. He's a, he's a down payment on the, the full package that is to come. And so we, we see here that we're going to read these verses and, and see if we can find the, how, how Joseph typifies Jesus. And uh, first off, uh, it, it goes without saying that, that um, Jacob loved Joseph and, and he loved him more than his other children. Now, he had 12 children. And he, the, he had 12 children. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. They come from Jacob's children. And they're also called the patriarchs of the, of the church. Those 12 tribes, uh, Jacob had a lot more wives than, than just the, his, his one wife. God promised him one wife, but he had slave wives. And so 11 of these children come from his slave wives, but Joseph came from his real wife. And I suspect that's why Joseph was special uh, to Jacob. Plus, he was his, uh, he was second to his youngest child, uh, Benjamin being the youngest. But Joseph uh, was born to him later on in his years, and I guess he could appreciate Joseph much more and he cherished Joseph. And uh, so it, it's a great parallel there because Jacob loved Joseph with all his heart. But then, you know, God in heaven loved his son, Jesus Christ. With all of his heart. And you know, as fathers and mothers here on earth, we love with an imperfect love. We love the best we can, but our love is not perfect. But God's love is perfect. It's totally perfect. And the way God loved Jesus Christ is the way God loves us. The same way. Can you imagine that? Can you believe that God loves us? The way that he loved his one and only son, Jesus Christ, with a perfect love. And you know what? I want to love with a perfect love. And, and the closest I can do to loving with a perfect love is love through Jesus Christ. To love with his love. Because when you get born again, when you get saved, Jesus comes into your heart and he gives you a love that's not your own. And so we can love people with the love of Jesus. And when we do, we are loving with a perfect love, a love that is not our own. And that's the kind of love that, that God had uh, for Jesus. And, and that's the kind of love that, that Jacob had for his son Joseph. Although he was an earthly father, there was still uh, a connection in and you know, uh, Joseph, he was different. He was distinct from the other brothers. There was something about him that was special. And, and you know, uh, the, the thing about Joseph that made him distinct is the fact that, you know, there is no record of Joseph ever sinning in the whole Bible. And now, does that mean Joseph was without sin, that he was not a sinner? Of course not. If he had flesh on his body, he was a sinner. But there's no record of him sinning. Why is that? Because even though the writers didn't know it at the time, God was guiding the writers as they wrote, and he was guiding Joseph's life. And he knew that he wanted Joseph to be a type for Jesus. He wanted Joseph to be a foreshadowing of Jesus. Now, I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned. If, if there's no one here who can say he's without sin, but there is one who never sinned, and that one is Jesus Christ. He never sinned. He, he was born of a woman, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That means that his blood was not mingled with human blood because it's the blood in us that has that sinful nature. So since Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, he didn't have that sin nature. Since he was fully God and fully man, he could live a life that was sinless. And in doing so, he fulfilled the law that we could never fulfill. That's why we needed Jesus, because we could never fulfill the law. The law was meant to just show us what kind of sinners we are. The law was meant to show us how we failed to live up to God's standards, but Jesus was able to keep every law and he never sinned. And in doing so, he fulfilled the law for us. So now I don't have to fulfill the law because Jesus fulfilled it for me. In living the sinless life 
that Joseph typifies here in his life. Yes, and, and not only that, but uh, that Joseph had a future dominion that he saw in his mind. And, uh, chapter 37, verses 5 and 6, it said, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet more. And he said unto them, Here I pray this dream that I've dreamed. He said, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood around and, and bowed to me. And then he goes on to say, Not only that, but the sun and the moon and the stars, they all bowed down. So what is he saying? Joseph said, Look, I'll put it in redneck English for y'all. Joseph said, We was out there in the field bailing up some hay, and I'll be dog. He said, Y'all come up to me, and y'all bowed down before me. And, and daddy bowed down, and, and mama bowed down, and y'all bowed down, and, and the sun bowed down, and the moon bowed down, and the stars, everybody was bowing down to me. Now, how do you reckon that made the brothers feel? They didn't care for that too much. They were like, oh, okay, so we are going to bow down to you. That's what you're saying. He said, well, that's my dream, <laughs> you know. That's my dream. And it's interesting because the Bible says this about it. He said, and when he told them about the dream in verse 5, he said, and they hated him yet the more. What does that mean? When he told them about the dream, they already hated him right much, okay? He was not like Mr. Popularity uh, back on the farm. But when he told them about this dream, they just hated him even more. It was like, that's the last straw. I knew it was something about him I didn't like, and now it goes to prove it. I hate him. That's it. I'm done with it. So they just flat out hated him. Why did they hate him? Because he had a dream. God put this dream in his heart for a reason. And let me tell you, I know there's some people here that God has put a dream in your heart. And you've probably experienced hate from the world. Matter of fact, I can just about guarantee when God puts a dream into your heart, the world is going to hate that. The, not Hopefully not Christians, but the, the regular world, they hate it when somebody has a dream, something that God has placed in your heart. I know everybody here has something that God has put in your heart and it, it may not be fulfilled or maybe it is or maybe you're waiting for it to be fulfilled. But if you have that dream in your heart, you're probably going to suffer persecution because the world hates to see somebody with hope. The world hates to see somebody who's living for a purpose. Because let me tell you, if you have a dream that God has placed in your heart, then you ought to be living for a purpose, the purpose of fulfilling that dream. And let me tell you, don't give up on your dream. Because just because it hasn't come true yet does not mean that God is not going to make that dream come true. God is a dream maker. And don't worry if the world hates you because of your dream. You'll be in good company because they hated Joseph. They hated Jesus. And they'll be hating you. But let me tell you, hold on to that dream that God has given you. I don't know what your dream is, but God does because he put it in your heart. And he is the one that will see it through if you will persevere. You believe that, church? Amen. I believe it. I believe God is the one who puts dreams in our hearts. It's what the Bible says. But uh, he, he, <laughs> that dream with, with uh, Joseph, it didn't turn out good because it was a dream of his dominion. But you know, Jesus Christ is going to have true dominion one day. What was foreshadowed with Joseph with, with the brothers bowing down to him, uh, was will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds. The Bible says, uh, I seen one, I think it's in the book of Daniel, it says, I seen one like the Son of Man. He, he was coming with the clouds and he was sitting at the right hand of God. And let me tell you, Jesus is at the right hand of God right now. And you know what he's waiting for? He's waiting for the last person to be saved. And when that last person is saved, Jesus Christ is coming. Because God will give him his marching orders. He will depart from heaven. He will bust that eastern sky wide open. And he's coming in the clouds to receive his church. And who is his church? I'm his church. You're his church. If you were born again, child of God, you are the church. 
And Jesus Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will receive the church in the air. And then there will be a time of great tribulation. But then, seven years later, Jesus is coming back. And he won't come in the clouds only. He will come and his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says at that time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. But I'm not going to wait till then to bow. I'm bowing now. Hallelujah. I'm bowing at the feet of Jesus. I love him. I'm proclaiming from the hilltops that Jesus is my Savior. And why wait? Why wait to bow? I bow to him now because he's my God. He's my Lord and my Savior. And he is worthy. He and he alone. Yes, Lord. Joseph was a was a partial fulfillment of that because his brothers did eventually bow down to him when when they uh, and we'll get to that much later probably by the looks of that clock it won't be this week but <laughs> I told them that this already turned into a series in the first service so it's a series because I'm far from I mean I ain't got much but it's it's taken a long time it's a lot in these little bit of notes here. Um, I, mean, I guess the, the notes just kind of keep me going in the right direction because all the stuff is right here. But it's that, uh, hey, so he had, he had his father's devotion, Joseph did. Uh, Jacob was devoted to his son just like God is devoted to Jesus. And then uh, Joseph had, had this faultless distinction of no recorded sin. Just like Jesus, and he lived a sinless life to defeat the law and fulfill the law for us. And then we have his future domination. Jacob, I mean, Joseph would eventually uh, be the, the second in charge over all the nation of Egypt. And in doing so, save his family. And when his brothers come, they will bow down to him. Just as we will all bow down to Jesus at his, as his second coming in glory. And the time is drawing nigh. It's coming soon. And then we, we see uh, Joseph, he was the beloved son, but he was also the suffering servant. And you know, that's just like us. If you serve Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, sooner or later, there's going to be some suffering involved in it. But Paul says, I love the way Paul puts it. He says, but this momentary light affliction that we may have to endure, is my interpretation, this momentary light affliction Affliction that we may have to endure pales in comparison to the future glory that is to be beheld at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So what's he saying? Although you may have some trials and troubles on this side of eternity, that once you get over on that side, it's going to be like nothing. And these little bit of troubles we have today pale in comparison to the future glory that we have waiting for us up there in heaven. But get ready for some trouble if you love Jesus. I'm going to just tell you. Get ready for some trouble. Uh, and, and Because Joseph was a suffering servant. Just like Jesus was a suffering servant. Isaiah chapter 55. A lot of Isaiah talks about Jesus being the suffering servant. And, and so Joseph is the suffering servant. Uh, he's a foreshadowing of this real true suffering servant of Jesus Christ. So what happens to Joseph? How does he suffer? Well, first of all, he suffers because he was sent. And y'all should maybe write that down. He suffered because he was sent. That's why Joseph suffered. That's why Jesus suffered. And that's why we suffer. Because we are sent. And so Genesis chapter 37, uh, 12 and 13 is... is uh, uh, where Joseph it talks about here. And let me tell you, 12 and 13, there's three little words at the end of verse 13 that will change your life. 12 and 13 say, And his brethren uh, went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send thee unto them. So let me just back up and uh, apply a little redneck interpretation to that for y'all. So what he's saying here, it's like Jacob, and he come up to Joseph, he said, Hey, Joseph, ain't them boys down there in Shechem feeding the cows? And, you know, getting the wheat and hay together and feed cows? He said, yeah, they down there. He said, Joseph, won't you go down there and check on them for me? Okay? Now, you know, I'll tell you this, because Lucas ain't here, I can talk about it. So when 
when I want some weed eating done, I say, look, is you, you mind getting that weed eating? Weed eating, because he loves cutting grass. Weed eating is not really his favorite. The, it, we, we weed eat because, you know, grass will be cut for a couple of days. I'm like, are you weeding for me? He said, well, um, let's talk about this, Dad, because, you know, it's about 95 degrees out there right now. And he said, don't you think it'd be better if we wait till like this evening when the sun goes down? Or, or maybe first thing in the morning might be a little better yet. And uh, so we have to talk about that thing. But that ain't the way Joseph was. And that ain't the way Jesus was. Because it's three little words here at the end of it. So uh, Jacob comes to Joseph. Boys down there feeding cattle. They're supposed to be. Well, won't you go check on them? And what did Joseph say? Three little words. And y'all say these words with me if you got it there in the Bible. If y'all ain't got your Bibles, just, just play along with us. And it says, Here I am. Well, here am I. Everybody want to say it. Three little words. Don't no matter what order you put them in. I am here. Here am I. Whatever. Them three words right there will change your life. Those three words changed Joseph's life because when he said, here am I, it, he said, here I am, I'm ready to do your will. When Jesus Christ was up there in heaven, he had been with God from all eternity. And see, that's something really difficult for us to understand. The fact that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're all three in one, but even more than that, God has no beginning. Now, everything we know, everything there is on this side of eternity, everything under the sun has a beginning. But God is not under the sun. He's over the sun. And He has no beginning. He has always been. Now, them, them people that come to your door relentlessly and knock, knock on it and try to lead you to their religion, well, they don't believe the fact that Jesus has been here forever. They think Jesus was created by God. But the Bible says Jesus doesn't have a beginning or an end either. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a beginning because they're all God and God has just always been. Now, I had a friend of mine. He said, well, I find it uh, a good way to explain it, Charlie. He said, uh, it's like God just stepped out of nowhere and there it was. And I said, well, no, that ain't right because that means if he stepped out of nowhere, that's a beginning. <laughs> But God didn't step out of nowhere because He's always been there. He didn't step out. He's just always been. And there's no way around it. And Jesus has always been with it. And the Holy Spirit has always been with it. No beginning and no end. And even if we don't understand it, it don't matter. You just got to believe it and accept it as true. And when you believe that, just imagine Jesus has been with God in eternity forever. And he's, he's got this divine glory all around him. And, and God comes up to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, you see what they're doing? They made a mess out of everything. They need a Savior. They need somebody to go down there and die on the cross and save them. Now, if that would have been Lucas, he'd be like, Well, there he is. Today? And you want me to go today? And uh, but I, I'm going to have to plan this out. But, but or, or Jesus could have just said, man, I don't really feel like it because I'm enjoying my divine glory right now and I'd rather not go down there and die on the cross. But he didn't. He said, here am I. And he done it. You know, the, the, you know what the first thing was that I learned when I became a preacher? First thing I learned is that people could actually say no to a church when the church asked them to do something. I didn't think this was a reality before. I'd never heard of such a thing as saying no to the church. Because when I was at my home church, I was there, the first thing they'd come home and say, Charlie, we'd like for you to be a uh, usher. Would you do that? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Because I sent them to ask other people, and they said, yeah, sure. And then we said, Charlie, a few years later, we'd like for you to be a deacon. I said, well, I'm honored. I'm sure I'll do it. Charlie, we'd like for you to be on building and ground. If we need some help, would you do it? Sure, I would do it. So I got in the first church, and it was deacon nomination time. I was like, okay, well, you've been at the church since like 50 years. Would you serve as a deacon? Oh, no, I can't do that. And I was like, what? What, what do you mean you can't do that? I can't do that. No, I don't, I don't know. They've asked me. 
me a bunch of times. I've always, they know I'm going to say no. I want to then ask somebody, we need, you know, we need somebody to work on building the ground. What are you doing? No, I can't do that. I don't know nothing about air conditioners. I can't, I can't work on building. So, I mean, it just, it busted my bubble that these people were actually saying no. And I've got to thinking to myself, what if Jesus would have said no? No, I don't, I don't save people. I don't hang on the cross. That's, that's way far below me. Get somebody else. Get one of them angels to do it. Or get Michael or Gabriel or one of them to do it. I don't want to do that. But no, he didn't. And so if Jesus would say, here am I, what is stopping us from saying, here am I? Because let me tell you, and y'all all know this, and this is about the time when them little goose pimples pop up on the back of your neck. Because we all know God is calling each and every one of us to do stuff for Him, don't we? He's calling each and every one of us in ways only you and Him know. He's calling you to service. Why? So you can live a fulfilled life. You know deep in your heart that there is something more to this relationship with Jesus than what you have now. You know deep in your heart God wants to give you more. He wants to elevate you and, and bless you more and give you life and life more abundantly. But the only thing stopping you is you saying, It's hard to get it out. I know. Right? Let's see if we can do it. If you really, if you really feel that way, if you really feel that way, I want you. We're gonna count to three, and I wish you would say it with me. And make it real easy. One, two. Make sure I don't do it the crazy thing, because my body's got to get in with me. One, two, three. Will be 
by far outweighed with what awaits us in heaven. And then, I want to tell you, if you say, here am I, to God, he will honor that. And he will make those dreams come true, the ones that people hate you for. He will use you in a way that will give you the fulfillment and the satisfaction that you know is still missing in your heart. Even if you've got a, uh, is, even if you've got a down payment on the fulfillment, God wants to really show you what true fulfillment is. And it all starts by those three words. Say it with me one more time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending Joseph, Lord, and, and using his life to point us toward Jesus Christ, Lord. Joseph was a good man, but he was nothing compared to Jesus. He was a great man, Lord. He was a man of God, and, and he was a type for Christ, but he was only the partial fulfillment. Now we can look to Jesus, the, the total fulfillment of all things, Lord, and we know the final fulfillment will come when He comes to get us, Lord, when, when He comes for the second time. Lord, help us to all be ready for that by saying, here and I. Lord, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name.